Um, Isaac reminds me to make a couple of announcements. The first is next week, for those taking the lecture class only, we will try to bring in a sheet showing you know, what our records are for things you've turned in, just so that you can make sure that we have recorded all of the whatchamadinkies that you have turned in. That's an official term. Um, the other thing is I want to be extra clear on how this goes with, um, with it. In the lecture series, you get one free absence, no questions asked. After that, if you have other absences, come clear. you have to come clear them with me before I will let you just have a pass on them, OK? So you've got to have a pretty good reason. Um, and uh, so come talk to me if you, if you have missed more than one or if you're anticipating missing more than one. And we will talk over how you can deal with that. Because we record all the lectures and post them, there are opportunities for you to read the lectures and do a response. Um, but I might require you to write a longer response um, to, because, you know, the one you turn in here is kind of just to prove you were here. Um, if you have to do a longer one, it'll have to be a prove you actually watched this whole boring thing um, <coughs> for various definitions of boring. All right. So today, uh, we are going to take some pros. Um, I have taken four of this, the students from my class, uh, the, the other class, um, the workshop portion of this class, I suppose. And we are going to be looking at their writing. It's only people I asked ahead of time to come up. So if I didn't call you up, that means I didn't grab yours. They're mostly people I was in this, um, I'm in this week. Uh, that I was, I was reading their writing, I picked a paragraph that I thought would, uh, that would be useful. Remember when we do this, everyone's writing can use some of this. So I'm not picking on people. In fact, I threw in one of my own um, for us to, to look at and see if we can change anything on it as well. So that's what we're going to do for part of this class. And then we'll see where we go after that. Um, let's go ahead and start with questions, though. Uh, we have done... Basically, everything we're going to do before transitioning into the business side of things, um, other than our three guest lecturers, which will start next week. Uh, so if there's something non-business related you want me to chat about um, or blab about or whatever, go ahead and ask me. Um, how do you, you you're, you're kind of asking about subtlety. You say, how do you make this character be stubborn, but not make it obvious to the reader that you're so trying to make this character? They, um, develop a character without having obvious obstacles to develop a character. Okay, how do you develop a character without That's obvious gradually. obstacles? Gradual? So, I, I'm not sure if I can quite understand. Yeah, um, you're, is this... Right. Um, that's kind of how we do writing. Um, it's just a matter of how subtle you want to do it or how stark you want your arc to be. Some characters start stubborn and end stubborn. Um, and um, it, it just the style of character you're talking about, like I've done ones where I'm writing along where they're a very self-aware character. And they kind of have to confront their problems and deal with them as the course through the course of the book. Not all people are self-aware in that way. Some people are more instinctive, and they work just by instinct. If you, you know, I often bring up Matt Cotham because I think he is one of Robert Jordan's best characters, um, and his progress is never self-aware, but he changes through the course of the books just by the way he acts. So it's the the subtle shows of his characterization that are that matter, and so. Um, how self-aware is your character? That's one thing I'd ask. Um, it sounds like you're asking how to do that without making it just like con how contorting your entire plot around, making that, that happen. And sometimes you do want to contort the plot around it, but usually when I'm working on a character and it's working really well, there will be plenty of opportunities to the natural progress of the plot for them to manifest the type of person they are. Um, and you know, practice with this is just come up with a very simple story um, a very simple scene and run four of your characters through it as the viewpoint protagonist and practice how they would each respond to the different stimuluses in this scene and see if you can write four different scenes for those characters. Then you know you've got depth of characterization. You've got a strong difference between your characters. And then, you know, try doing that for your character at the end of your book and say, all right, how will they react to it now, this same scene? Um, and maybe that will give you some guideposts uh, on what to do. I've done that before with characters and it's worked for me. I don't know. It's a hard one to answer because it seems like a very individual thing you're trying to get at. Yes? Since you've randomly picked a title, every winter semester you 
have three week readings of his books uh-huh. that coincide that you have a new book out. Yes. Do you usually have all your books that have come out the day the market hit? Um, I do not really get to choose when the book releases are. Um, for years, I had a fall release only. Um, and then I started having a fall and a summer release. And it's just by when they slot things, when things come out, and when I turn things in. I would really like to get back to having fall releases because it's easier for this class. And, you know, then you get the Christmas season and things like that. But in the spring, um, there's less competition for bestseller lists. And so, for instance, when um, A Memory of Light and things like, well, I shouldn't say A Memory of Light, when like Gathering Storm or Towers of Midnight, I'm trying to remember which one, but one of those came out November-ish, and we had a John Grisham book right after it, and we had a um, Dan Brown book right before it. And so we had to like squeeze it into the one week where we thought we could get number one, and we did. Um, But, you know, we, we had to get number one, like one of those weeks, Grisham had come out the week before, and the second week he was out, he sold 120,000 copies in hardcover, and we sold like 150, right? In his first week, he sold like 200. So if we'd been up against him first week, we wouldn't have gotten number one. But second week, we did. And I'm, those numbers are not exact. I can't quite remember what they are. But, you know, A Memory of Light, which came out in January, um, it was like, you know, 150,000 copies. And the number two was like 25. Um, and so <laughs> depending on when you release, you can really – um, not just get bestseller placement. Bestseller placement is very important because a lot of bookstores, depending on your bestseller list placement, they will then the next week place you on a bestseller rack, which is kind of like free advertising um, and things like that. Um, beyond that, there's this thing we call co-op. Co-op is when a bookstore lets the publisher, they'll go to the publisher usually, they, and they say, we'll give you this many slots um, in the front of our store. You know, like when you walk to a Barnes & Noble, there's like that, they call it the octagon. There's also upright stands and things like this. Um, this is all paid space. Um, the only thing you, you get on without paying is the regular bookshelf. Usually the end caps are paid space too. <coughs> and that paid space is what we call co-op, where it's not really usually money just paid by the publisher. It is if you put my book here and you sell it, you can keep an extra 50 cents of that book sold. So that gives... Um, motivation for the bookseller to pick books they think will sell well, but it also gives motivation to the, the publisher because they want to get that extra, that extra space. So there's like this give and take where you both kind of settle on books you think will do better and um, will be good in that location. Um, so it's not completely just sold space, but it mostly is. Um, getting that co-op can be much harder if, for instance, J.K. Rowling wants that co-op space. Um, J.K. Rowling is going to sell more copies in that space, and if they're going to put J.K. Rowling there, they're going to get a lot more of that extra 50 cents than if they put Brandon Sanderson there. And so if they're like, we've sold all our co-op space to all these people, then it's much harder to get the co-op. Um, now, most of my books are big enough that I will be the one that is getting the co-op instead of someone else, but um, there is that give and take, particularly as a new writer, where you could in March get co-op that you'd never get in the fall. That said, book sales, we found that generally February is like the weakest month for book sales. It really depends on your genre and things like that. But it tends to be the, 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 the month you least want to release in. And March is a little bit better, but it, doesn't, it takes till April before general book sales start picking up quite a bit more. So um, it depends. If your publisher's like, we're going to release you in February – like they released the Lego movie in February or January or whenever it was because no, there's no competition and you'll get everybody who goes out even though ma- ma- more, fewer people are going out to buy books or watch movies, whatever. That can be really good for you or it can, you can be one of the ones where they kind of throw it into that month because, well, at least they're not you know, wasting one of their prime slots, right? It's the same sort of thing that happens with movies. And so being put in a February slot can be either really awesome for you or really terrible. And I have no idea how to tell you to judge which it is because your publisher will always tell you that's the really wonderful one. (laughs) (coughs) Um, But if you're self-publishing, which we'll talk about a lot, then these things matter a lot less because this is the way that um, people's retail habits go. Um, By the way, January tends to be pretty good for books even though it's really bad for films. Um, that's because people give a lot of gift cards and a lot of e-readers um, as Christmas presents. And so when someone gets a book gift card or an e-reader, they generally then spend the gift card or open up the e-reader, and then January they tend to buy. And we found that January tends to be really pretty good for books. Um, it's February once those book uh, 
gift cards are all gone, that then not, a lot less sells. Interestingly, you'll notice, uh, you probably didn't notice, but I noticed a few years ago when during the big contract disputes between the big six and Amazon, Amazon chose February to be the month where they, they pulled all the publisher books and didn't sell them for a month because that's the month that they don't sell as well anyway. So. All right, any other questions? Yes. Do I ever pick an element of my writing? And I repeat this because we're now recording with this microphone thing. Do I pick an element of my um, of my writing that I want to work on and then write a book um, specifically for it? Yes, I do. Basically, every book I'm writing, I will pick one thing specifically I want to be working on and try to do that better. Now, of course, you want to get generally better on everything all the time. But um, yeah, I, I do that quite consciously with a lot of books. Um, and some books, you know, it, it'll be different from other books. Um, with Warbreaker, you can tell pretty obviously I was working on humor and different styles of humor in that book. Um, and if you read that, there's different types of humor. I was also working on the idea of reversals um, and things like that. Whereas um, Way of Kings, I really wanted to take my world building to another level and really focused on that. Um, you want to do everything in every book, but I will do these things. And oftentimes when you see a shorter piece from me, it's me experimenting with one thing. Uh, the Emperor's Soul, which is one of my shorts, was can I write a story that basically all takes place in one room? Um, whereas Legion was let me try doing something, a, a contemporary um, detective story sort of thing and see if that, explore that genre. Um, so there you are. Yes, today um, our little excerpt is from Death by Pizza, which is uh, my attempt at urban fantasy. So... <laughs> Uh, we shall see. I didn't even know if we'll get to mine, but yeah. <laughs> what? What? Okay. Yeah. What kind of time commitment does it take to become um, a great writer? It really is going to depend on where you're starting, skill level wise, and your own style of writing. Let me explain. Uh, Eric Flint. A uh, friend of mine in the industry writes a lot of alternate history books and science fiction books. Uh, quite a good writer. Eric Flitt is what he self-describes as a binge writer. Um, for Eric, as far as I can tell, even way back when he was starting, what he would have to do is take three or four months and write like 12 or 14 hours a day and get the book out of his system beginning to end and then be done. And then he doesn't write again for months. Um, my friend Jancy, Jancy, she'll come talk to you guys. You can ask her about this because I know she binge writes quite a bit. <coughs> There's like six months of the year where she's writing and six months of the year where she's not. Um, and during that other time, she's thinking about writing, she's revising, she's thinking, whatever. You can ask her about that. Um, I am a day, you know, write my thousand, uh, 3,000 words every day writer. It's really more like 2,500 most days. Um, but it's like every day I write that much. And when I was trying to break in, it was less, but I did it every day. Um, every day consistently, and I needed like four hours minimum, and I need a block. I can't write for 30 minutes, stop, then you know, find 30 minutes later and write because it's like I have an hour of warm-up during which you know, I'm getting like 200 words an hour, and then I get into it, and I'm doing like you know, five or uh, 700 words an hour. In the end, it's going really well, and then I kind of transition out of it, and it's slow again. <coughs> and that's about a, a four-hour block for me. Um, which gives me like two hours in the middle of really solid writing. If I don't get a four-hour block, um, my writing never quite gets going, um, I've found. I can kind of force myself to, but it doesn't work as well. Other writers are much better. Um, there's, a, there's a woman in my writing group that, you know, she writes for 30 minutes and then watches TV and is distracting, comes back and dabbles for 30 minutes and things like this. Um, so, yeah, um, we say write every day. But there's a big old asterisk on that write every day, which is figure out what works for you. And if writing eight hours a day during the summers between you know, classes and, and things and finishing an entire novel and then spending the rest of the semester, you know, the two semesters, spending one hour a day revising or working on an outline for what you're going to do the next summer works for you, great. Or if, even if it's do that binge writing and then on weekends you do your revisions and planning and you don't write anything during the weeks, if that makes you produce fiction, then that's your process and learn how to maximize it. Um, so try different things and see what happens. Um, there is credibility to this whole 10,000 hours thing. 
but I don't know if the numbers, you know, are as accurate as that. Uh, but the concept is accurate. The concept is, for most of us, we are going to have to spend several years, as many as 10, practicing this and learning our own style before we become a true master at this form. And even then, hopefully, we'll still be learning and getting better. But it's at that kind of where we, time where we cross the threshold into what we do is consistently very good. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, right here. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I have a Go for it. Um, there's that should word, um, and my my whole kind of um, mandate for myself for this class is to use as few shoulds as possible and as many can or what do you wants. Does that even work? <laughs> as possible. <laughs> Um, Self-publishing is ext extremely viable in today's market. Um, there are plenty of writers who are earning a full-time income with their writing, self-publishing, never really having any print editions and working completely off of electronic publishing. Um, it, it works. I will give you some pointers I've found out. When should you be considering it? I think that the... It, it, it depends on your own feelings. For instance, if having print editions in the bookstores is a very big deal to you, if you do not want to bother with hiring an editor, with do it, finding a cover, with doing cover design, and releasing the book yourself, if these things are bothersome to you, and I know writers, they're like, this is, that's something I never want to do. I don't want to worry about that aspect of it. If I have to worry too much about that aspect of it, I'll stress so much that I will never get my writing done. For these people, traditional publishing only is still, you know, the, the most viable thing. Uh, for other people who are like, wow, you know, I could do this all myself. I, you know, I'll talk about finding artists and things like this, and I'll talk about finding editors and things like this. Um, I could do all of this. That sounds kind of fun to me doing it all myself, then you, um, using, you know, saying should, then you probably want to consider self-publishing from the get-go, right? Um, my whole kind of, my quest when I started getting publishing, you know, one of the fu found fu fundamental rules of my quest was don't close any doors. Be willing to take any opportunity and try anything. This is why I submitted to publishers and agents when some people would say, oh, you really should submit only to agents. No, I submitted to everybody that I felt I could get a book to with, you know, we'll talk about how to match your books appropriately. It's not like I'm sending a book to a children's publisher that only does picture books when it's a 400,000 word fantasy epic. Um, but within reason, I'm sending to everyone. And if I were breaking in right new, now, that mandate, knowing that I am, um, am pretty self-motivated and like aspects of the publishing industry, I would be trying both. I would have a book that I'm submitting traditionally, um, or, or several of them. I probably, every year, since I write about two books a year, what I would probably be doing is writing one book and trying to publish it traditionally, and I would be writing two shorter books instead of one book, two, you know, 50,000 word length books, and doing those self-published, and I would just see what takes off, because I wouldn't want any doors closed to me. But we will talk about all of this. So what is the should? The should is what are you comfortable with and how fast do you write? Those are kind of the, the, the sliding scales. If you can only write a book every four years, self-publishing is not for you. Um, if you can only write a book every four years, then being an academic is probably for you. Um, <laughs> Joking a little bit about that, but not really. Um, <laughs> because you're, every four years, you're going to have to be really good and sell quite a bit to get four years' worth of income off of one book. But if you are, you know, I mean, Connie Willis writes one book every four years, right? She's fantastic. I think Connie still does academia um, and things like this. And so, yeah, it depends. All right, let's go ahead. Oh, yeah, we'll do one more. Go ahead. I know the answer is probably just because of the internet. Right. But Right. Um, I personally do not like online writing groups. The face-to-face -face interaction and the people talking about 
stories and seeing how they how animated they are and how their body language is and their facial expressions and things, I can't do an online writing group. It just never has been very useful to me. Um, I do have friends who do Skype ones, and they like them. They're kind of a, a necessary evil since their good writing group members moved away. I would suggest that your best shot at a writing group is finding people from a class like this or from LTUE or something like this that you can then invite into a writing group, get it going, and don't feel bad if it kind of falls apart after three years or, some, or two years or something like that. Take a few members from it, try some other new members, and try a new writing group. Writing groups do tend to evolve a lot, particularly I found in the early years and things like that, but it's going to depend on what works for you. I just can't make those work for me. And so my writing group right now still contains the majority of members are people I met in this class. Um, it has been, this is the third incarnation of it. And so there are new people that haven't been in the class and things like that. But the, the core of it is still me and Peter and Kaylin and Dan when he's not in Germany. Um, and that's, you know, that's my writing group and it's worked for me and it is this class where I found it. All right, let's go ahead and do this. So I'm going to steal Isaac's chair. Sorry, Isaac. Um, he's going to have to find another chair. We're going to dim the lights. And so what we're going to do is, um, is we are going to <coughs> take these, um, these students who were very nice in allowing us to um, work on their pieces and we are going to just try to revise them. How we we got to dim the lights a little bit, right? Or do you care? I, th I think having it just the front ones off was going to be helpful. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to try to revise this. We're going to find places to show versus tell. We're going to decide where we feel that we should use more words and where we should feel we should use fewer words. And I'm just going to kind of do it, um, lead it my way. Now, the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to um, go turn on track changes. In fact, um, I'm going to turn them on down here. All right. So right-clicking gives you the track changes, and you can turn track changes on and off um, so that we can see what we're doing. Yeah. A little bit bigger. Yeah. All right. Zoom. How's that? Much better. All right. Um, by the way, just, just for fun, other things that I always do to Microsoft Word, all right? Um, if you guys don't do this, then, um, you know, maybe this is a, so autocorrect options. Microsoft Word likes to autocorrect everything. If you don't click off this button, every time you like backspace um, and things like that, it will think, oh, they want an autocorrect feature for this, and they'll add, like, random autocorrect things. I think it's better than it used to be, but it's really annoying. So remember to turn that off. Um, I always turn off this because I don't want them um, making my hyphens into dashes because I like to do it my way. But um, that will all get erased once this computer or whatever. But all right. So oh, I also really like to have the document out, the document map out. Um, I wonder how normally I put that on the ribbon. All right, well, we won't do that. Well, yeah, we won't bother you guys with that. So here we have Colby's writing. Colby, raise your hand. Yay, Colby, thanks. Um, now, what we're going to try and do is just take this paragraph. I want you guys to, to read through the paragraph. I'm going to give you a few minutes, and I want you to be thinking about ways you could change this using what we discussed, about, discussed last week. So the pyramid of abstraction, um, the writing small, concrete details as opposed to large, sweeping details. Um, looking for repeated constructions when you say something and then you, you, you show it and then you tell it, or you tell it and then you show it. All of these things, let's look at this and see what we would do. All right, so take a few seconds.
All right. I read it, so that's, we're going to take that. Um, <laughs> well, we're going to go sentence by sentence, so it's okay. So um, my instincts on this say this is, um, this is pretty good. We are getting a sense of the scene. Um, I don't see any major flaws in this. That's one of the reasons I picked it, as I wasn't looking for stuff with big flaws. But I was looking for stuff that we could do a, a pass on. It feels wordy to me. There are too many words in this for what we're doing. And also, I feel that there are places where it's just not concrete enough. So let's start talking about this first sentence, and let's tighten this first sentence. The goal is going to be to cut out words. Um, what do you think we could do to, to, to trim this down? Yeah. Stupid thing is not letting me. Where are we are? Draft. Okay, there we are. Ah, Microsoft Word. Stop being lame. <laughs> this is Word 2010, which I do, or 2000, the newest one, which I do not like. I like 2010. I do not like the newest one. All right, there we are. Um, okay, so the Golden Crown, you could even just do this, right? The Golden Crown was located one street over from the Royal Palace. Or you could say it wasn't in. Um, I do think getting that in there earlier is a good idea. This isn't trimming, but, um, but one thing that you want to do in, along with this idea is we want to f follow the character's attention, okay? And so the character's attention is on the inn, so why is the description of the inn way down here? Where is our description? Um, Right here. Um, our, our description then is way down here, um, which makes me wonder, you know, why is it not up here? That's one of the first things I would do. It would be like, we're describing the end. Let's put it there. Now, there could be reasons why you don't want to do that because the character's attention isn't really on the end at the moment. The character's attention is on something else, and then you're going to get a description of the end or the, the narrative flow, but that, that's one thing. What else can we do to this first sentence, though? Over here. Right, right. How can we turn the noble car carriages into a show? How can we make this a present visualization as opposed to a telly description? Anyone want to try a sentence? Go for it. Okay, there's, there's definitely a show um, that we could do. Yeah. So we could just move the description to the coat of arms up a bit. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Anyone else want to take a stab at it? Yeah, in the back. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the things that we're tr he's trying to get across is that there are many different ca carriages, which is what he says. And so we need a sentence that, if we can, conveys that, that without saying it like this, maybe the way he said it is the best way to do it. Yeah, if you wanted a, a specific description, I think that's the way you may want to go, is say, a carriage passed with this co color, and the driver yelled at the carriage in front of them who was waiting to drop off its noble occupant that had this bright color. That's more words. And so maybe this image is not one. Colby's the only one that can really decide in the context of this story if those words were ones that he wanted to expend here or if he wanted to move beyond it. Yeah, we'll go right here. Yeah, so like maybe the use of the fact that it's a carriage. Yeah, that's one of the first things I noticed. Right here, right? The could be seen um, is the passive voice. Now, I like doing this where we just show it. The passive voice is when nobody is doing the thing. It's could be seen. Um, and one of the things um, that I would want from this um, is to get her a little bit closer, this Sarah, um, a little bit closer in and get across the sense of her familiarity with it. And so I might construct a new first sentence that has them pulling up and, you know, three carriages in line, and she looks out and, you know, remembers the food that she had here last time. Like, I hope they still have the roasted beets. Those were so good, um, which is, shows what she likes, that she's, um, that she's been here before, you don't have to say she's been here before if she thinks, I love the roasted beets here, or, oh, where's the, where's the, the master's cat that I always play with, or whatever it is that about her that makes her interesting that we apply to this. 
Um, and so I would want to start up here with, um, with character, if we can. Um, would just be one of my things. Looking at, since the, 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 the paragraph transitions into her anyway, I'd probably do that. Now, that's not the only way to do it. Uh, certainly not the only way to do it. I don't think that this, this is a, a bad way to crush it, but I do think we have to get rid of this could be seen and just say many other noble carriages came and went. So what we just did right there, this is like a basic level change without changing anything too fundamental, is we took out the passive voice and we made it active. The carriages are doing something rather than carriages being seen by no subject doing something. <coughs> um, and so, um, and then we've got this thing right here that we've already talked about, which is kind of a vague image. You know, if instead you park behind someone with a crest, with a, with a griffin rising, um, rising, or, you know, with a lion um, roaring, or, you know, a heart that's been stabbed to the wall with, a with an arrow. Whatever, you know, your royal crests are like, or your noble house's crest, then that's an image. Um, particularly if any, of, any possibility that a noble house is important later on in the story, mentioning them here and characterizing them as the one that's yelling at the other ones, then you've suddenly got, oh, this noble house, I'm going to run into one of their nobles later on, and I will remember this incident we've given foreshadowing to who they are. It's a missed opportunity, I feel, if there are any use of these nobility later on. All right? Um, so we've already talked about stayed here on the rare, stayed here on the rare occasions. Um, so we, we would want to get across that it's a rare treat um, for her to come, to come along. Is there any way we can construct a sentence that, that, that gets this across? Um, with, in, a, in a more characterization way. Yeah, Matt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, you totally can show giddiness. Another thing you could do right here is you could have her notice a difference depending on who she is and what she might notice, if she notices that her favorite cat seems to have had kittens, then she's like, oh, I wish I would have you know, been here earlier. Um, they're all grown up now, or something like that, to get across that she didn't get to come last time, but she's been here before. All right. Um, all right. Now, this sentence is really awkward. All right. Um, the, these two sentences, um, really. Um, are really awkward, which is, um, you know, uh, I shouldn't say really. Um, they aren't that, I mean, they're very legible, they're very readable. But these are the sort of sentences that I look to say, how can we make this an image? How can we make this about character instead of just a description of the scene? Because these sentences are doing one thing. They aren't giving us the character's emotion. They aren't giving us plot. They are only giving us a description of the situation, and it's an abstract situation. It's not one, you know, she's thinking about the fact that she doesn't get to come. We've got all this extra inf information about her father that may be important, but these are, these are sentences that have a big bullseye on them when I'm doing a revision. And I end up with sentences like this all the time in my revisions that I need to find a way to make these more active, okay? Let's see. Now... This right here, I would probably new paragraph that just because we, um, the way it's written right now, just pretend that it's, it's written this way, we are now diverting from a description of the place to her actively doing things. Yeah. If you have your journal with her, yeah. you could very easily have, she hadn't been in the scene a while because she couldn't the last time she was there. Right, yes. It depends on how important the journal is to her, but that's, that's exactly right. Like, I like this one because suddenly here, um, She's doing something. Like, this is a great sentence. She's pulling the journal close to her chest and watching the crowds. Those are two very, you know, number one, it tells us that there are crowds. This is a busy place. And she's got a journal, and she's making, you know, she's giving us visual cues of how she feels with the emotional state she's in. And so these are the sort of sentences that we want to look for more. Um, now, how could we make this a more... Act, or, um, how can we, if we want to add words to this, I think it's a great sentence. If we wanted to take a step up or down the pyramid of abstraction, what do we do with this sentence? Yes. Okay. 
Okay, okay. Yes, replace clouds. That, that's what I do. I would replace the crowd with individuals. Um, and make her use the journal. Is this, this is her journal where she writes about things. Is she like, I'm going to have to write about this wonderful experience of seeing these things. What can pass on the street that she would never see back home that is so interesting about the world, that can tell us things about the world and tell us things about her, that she can be like, oh, I've got to write down about this so later on I can describe this scene in my journal if that's who she is. We have to, you know, we have to know who she is. But yes, the way you move that down on the pyramid abstraction is you pick out a few examples of people that can display things about your world. But again, the, these are not hard, fast rules. If you're doing this, to do this correctly, you're going to add at least another sentence here. Um, and you, as writers, have to decide, do I want this more succinct sentence that's focused on her and her emotions, or do I want to start diverting, since this is a descriptive section, some of that attention to some of the specifics of, of what is passing me on the street? All right? Yes? Uh huh. <laughs> right. Right. Definitely a, a direction you could go. I, I worry about that getting too wordy as well. You just have to be, be able to do it tightly, but yeah. Does anyone want to give us an example? Let's do something on the street. Let's write something really concrete. Just give me a, try and come up with something in four or five words that's a really concrete thing of something she could see on the street. Not knowing Colby's um, world at our, all, it's okay. We, this is not something we're saying he should do. It's just if we wanted to. All right, right here, example. Oh, cool. Okay, how do you how do you, how are you gonna describe that? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 So you could you could describe a, a wealthy merchant passing by with a line of guards before and a line of guards behind, and describe what kind of jewelry, what's valuable in this world. This may be a world where something unique is valuable. If it is, you could do something very cool, covered in shells, right? He's got sh shell bracelets and shells on his hat, and you're like, wow, he's got the really expensive shells, um, or something like that, right? <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Exactly. This could be an area to show something specific about the culture as well. Did they have puppet shows? What do they think of them? Yes. That is one of the things I was looking for is the other senses. To build, bring this down on the pyramid abstraction, if you describe the sound, like you said with the minstrels, that's a great one. Or the crier yelling out, you know, I have information on this. Who wants to pay me for it? Or whatever it is that happens in the city, getting the sounds, the scents, all of these things. Yes? You can then still include the wooden stone of the city because we're doing that. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you went longer, ground, gi giving us more of her viewpoint would probably be something important to do here if you're expanding this because we've started with her, um, right? First, the first sentence is about her. So we're going to want to see these people and her reaction to them because you're kind of giving this promise. This is, the, this is the character paragraph. Above it was the non-character paragraph as it's stated right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh no, I actually fix it. I don't put the, the editing marks on. Um, I will. I will go through and just have it. But there'll be editing marks all over it, from my assistants and from my editor. Um, and they will each be highlighted. You know, if you ho hover over them, it says who wrote it. Um, it'll 
by, be by each of them as well. And usually what happens nowadays is my editor goes through and does all of this stuff with the editing marks. And then it goes to Peter, my editorial assistant, who goes through and makes, just accepts all of them that he thinks I would just naturally accept, um, which is most of them, and leaves like the 10% that he thinks I might not want to change or that I think he thinks I might want to make a larger change or something like that, and he leaves those. And so I'm really only having to deal with 10% of the edits um, that come back. Um, but then added to that are Peter's own comments, which are less line edit and more, hey, you know, you really, for continuity reasons, probably want to mention this here, or this is out of continuity with this chapter and things like that, along with what Isaac has added and, and people like that. But yeah, I won't, I won't do it in editing marks. Now, if you like the editing marks thing, one nice thing about, um, and I, I'm not sure if the older words can do this. The new word does do this version where, where is it, this one that anything you kind of, it, it doesn't highlight things in the same way, um, so it's easier to look at it as a, as a real thing. It'll keep any additions, um, but if you, um, yeah, um, w yeah, anyway, it, 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 it can work better for that and leave your track changes. I'm just so used to working in this thing that I like it better like this, so. All right, um, shall we do a little bit more? What time do we got here? Let's go on to the next one. All right, Colby, well done. Thank you. All right, we're going to do Michelle. Michelle, raise your hand. You are, oh, hi, Michelle. There you are. Yay, Michelle. <laughs> a little bit bigger. Got it. All right, so how's that for size? Okay. All right, so um, this paragraph I felt was actually quite strong. Um, and this is the sort of paragraph that I run across in my writing where I'm like, eh, nothing's really wrong with this one. Um, what I'm liking about this paragraph is this is a very character-focused paragraph. And you can see her emotion through the whole thing and everything she's doing, which I really liked. She's melding plot and character together. But I often get to things like this, um, and I'm like, what can I add to make the scene a little more concrete and visual? This is a very different paragraph from the last one, which I felt had too many words. This one potentially might not have enough. And so my question to you is, this is a different style of paragraph. What can we do to this? And at the end, you, we may do all this, and you may say to yourself, no, I liked it better the first way, and that's fine. My goal with doing these sorts of things is to teach you the op options you have for making your writing more descriptive. So looking at this paragraph, um, where are places that you spot that we could be more concrete? Yes? Can you put the blank down on page mm -hmm. 17? This one says, if you can bring together that which is called the idea of fit, then you can include that fear in the fear of the character. Yeah, that, I think that was one of the, 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 the awkward sentences in this. Um, um, I think that um, it's... Um, she hasn't decided to steal a knife yet, but she's already thinking about sticking him with it. And I think this sentence um, really does need a little bit of work. Can you rewrite this sentence in some way um, just to, 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 for clarity? Um, I don't know the question. Please feel free to use it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, um, right, go back here. Okay, there you go, there you go. So re it's just a matter of reordering there. What's another way? Any other suggestions? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's getting pretty awkward, though. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Okay, so let's, let's take that as one way we could take this. Um, if, if we wanted to add more to it, we could do something um, where, you know, she's like, she wasn't supposed to have one, but could imagine the satisfaction satis yeah, of slicing, wow, slice, uh, unfamiliar keyboard, yeah, off her hair, one annoying chunk. At a time, something like that, right? Yeah, chunk, chuck, chunk, chunk, chunk at a time, right? Um, so one annoying chunk at a time. But if you if you do something like this, it's letting us follow her attention a little bit better. Now, the thing is, what was strong about the first piece is that it does feel very stream of consciousness which could match this character and this writing style better than kind of doing it the Brandon way, which is giving a, a stronger direction of what she's going. In this case, you know, she can imagine, uh, she wasn't supposed to have one, but can imagine the satisfaction, of, you know, um, Kinsey would have a fit. Then she imagines sticking him with it, right? It's a parallel to structure, right? If you build it like that, that's one way you could go with this, but it is not in the same style. And I don't think this is what Michelle would want to do, um, it's just showing one direction you could take this. We'll go here and then back there. Right. Yeah, I would assume in this scene, this chapter, we already know Kinsey by this point in the book. He's already forbidden her to do some of these things and whatnot, but yeah. Um, the other thing is I get from this a little more whimsy than that. I don't think she actually wants to kill Kinsey, at least from the tone of this paragraph. She just likes the idea of stabbing him because it's amusing to her. Back here. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, you, we could even cut the fit, right? You could just cut that fit, the idea of the fit, or, yeah. Okay, let's just, let's just go ahead and close out the sentence. The, the problem we're having, just so you all know, is that we aren't following the character's um, l line of reasoning. Because she hasn't decided to take the knife, but she can, she's, um, she's, you know, you weren't supposed to have one. Anyway, so there's a, there's a, a little um, hiccup there. Okay, let's go on to something else. <coughs> yeah. Right, uh, the first time I read, she conquered the little boy. I wasn't mm -hmm. sure what was happening. Um, okay. What I would suggest is, uh, you know, if this is the first time she's doing something like that, have her do something. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going to assume that we already know that she conjures, but we're going to pretend for the sake of this how we would do it in a more descriptive way. All right? So, Michelle, again, this is us just going off um, somewhere. I don't think this is a flaw in the writing. I'm sure you've done it before. But one thing that did highlight for me is that um, when I like to do a magic, one of the things I look for is what is the character doing when they perform the action of magic? For instance, when you say, you know, the, a, a, a master carpenter carves something, you can describe what they're doing as they're carving, and it, you can make concrete images from that to pull the reader into the writing as they are doing this thing that's very solitary. Any sort of art that we do in our world, you have those things for. Yet in magic, we frequently like to just come up with the shortcuts of this thing just happening which there's no rule that says you can't, right? It's your magic. You can do whatever you want. But I try to construct my magic in such a way that it has at least visual, if not auditory or other sensory components to it so that it gives me the chance as the writer to use these tools. And simply conjuring means that we don't have anything there. And so <coughs> I, as a writer would start brainstorming, what can I do to give myself more tools as a writer to make these more visually interesting? Um, and I, I do a lot of illusions in my books. Um, and there's, there are a lot of them I've done. In one book, someone is throwing up 
piece, handfuls of dust and conjuring into it very subtly as you go, and you are seeing images come out of the dust, and it's almost like, you know, boom, there's an, there's an image here. And another one, um, the character is using smoke in the same way and conjuring things out of the smoke to give us visualizations of something forming and something being done as we are approaching um, using, using magic, right? So the question to you then is, um, what would you want to do here? Um, maybe for your own style, you don't want to do that, but it is a cool tool to have, all right? So I want to highlight that. Does anyone have any suggestions? This is not for Michelle. This is just for this piece taken on its own. What would you do? What are things you could do to make this more active um, a thing, a conjuration? Yes? I was thinking about the question yeah. Physical okay. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Okay, you could totally do that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to do it. Um, Words of Radiance, uh, Shalon's an illusionist. What she does, she has to draw something first before she can, she can create an illusion of it. So I actually have the act of drawing, which crafts the illusion. Yeah. Right, you could rip it out of the painting. That'd be a great image, something like that. Um, I was writing a book where I actually cut this magic because it felt too similar to things I had done before, but it was, um, I was having somebody Photoshop reality, right, where they did something and then they're like smudging it with like the thumb as the smudge tool and they're, you know, and you, you just, something like that where there's something to actually physically be doing. Um, what these things allow us, these are all one style. There's another style you could do where, you know, it's, it's, um, where, I don't know, Let, let's try something that doesn't involve crafting the illusion like you're drawing it. Some of my favorite magic systems to perform the magic, they don't necessarily have to do anything physical. Yeah. But they have to use like their mind or their awareness or their consciousness to access right. the, ma the source of the magic and magically yeah. convert it. Definitely another way you could go. Robert Jordan has the whole idea of to use, when Rand's using, learn to use the magic, he has to summon the, the, the void, right? Where he, the, it's a meditation practice. He imagines a candle flame and burns everything around it until his mind is empty, which is a nice, it is abstract, but it's at least something active he can be doing so that when you, you come to a time where you have the magic, you know, maybe she wants a magic that, you know, she doesn't want to have to take 20 minutes to come up with a little, uh, uh, an image of a little boy. That doesn't work for this scene but have something that the character does in order to give us something to latch onto. Okay? Yeah. Let's. Just like this, you know, when you perform a magician, you see the illusion of a little boy, and then what you can do with it, you put it in your head, and she breathes out the little boy image. Right, yeah, okay. I think one of the interesting things you have here is that it has a name. Mm -hmm. The illusion itself has a name. It has a Robbie. Ah, uh, yeah. Robbie's probably a character that we've, we've seen before in the book. Oh, that, that, that's cool, yeah. Um, okay, uh, let's go ahead just to another paragraph of, uh, of hers. Um, let's read these next two paragraphs. Now let's do the next three and look for things that we would, we would maybe want to revise line edit wise. Okay, some good stuff in here too. Let me talk about some of the good things that are going on here. This whole palms thing is awesome, right? This is not from our world, but it's a very natural sort of thing. Um, it, it actually reminds me uh, of Korea a little bit where if you're going to hand something to someone, you do it with both hands, or if you're going to shake hands, you put your other hand here to show that you're not holding a dagger with the other one, um, <laughs> which is kind of a cool thing. And here is to show your, the marks on your hands so that you can give them, you know, some comfort, even though he doesn't actually have any. But it's a nice cultural thing. This is really good because it, sh it evokes 
It's a something you can do that evokes culture and constantly reminds us that we're not in our world. Um, really great world building aspect right here. All right, now let's talk about things that, um, that we noticed that line edit wise we might want to fix. Go for it. Yeah. She could be. She definitely could be. Now, I'm going to say on this one, this is a could, not a should. Um, a lot of times, you just have you, you can't do this with every sentence, right? Well, maybe you could, but it, it we actually get really distracting. It's not really just show don't tell. It is show some of the times instead of telling. Um, but that's. What's that? Show the right amount, yeah, for what you're wanting to do. So I'm, I don't really think this is a big deal except for the, the fact that there's an extra comma um, because we have a single subject, right? I'm not going to give you a grammar lesson, but if you don't know why there shouldn't be a comma there, don't worry. If we all do it, then... Um, then What's that? This isn't the Oxford comma. No, it's not. It's not. Um, because please access, she's feeling two things. Oh, you're doing Oxford. Um, I see. No, I think I do like the Oxford comma. Yeah, it's the lack of parallelism that's throwing me off. I think I think you're you're okay with that comma as you describe it. Um, but I'm seeing this as a parenthetical, right? With this to these two things, it's a really awkward sentence if it's not a parenthetical, which is why I'm looking to get rid of it. Okay, you know your stuff. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, what, what else do we want to do on this? Uh, the editor in me is uh, saying to take a look at the diction. <coughs> we have the word spasm, we have inflected, uh, we have lob down in the last paragraph. Each mm -hmm. one I feel are a little odd words for, uh, for this context. I understand the author has some license to do that, right. but they're creating some weird images in there. I'm going to disagree with you on this one. Uh, this is author prerogative, and if you were a copy editor, I would not want you doing that to my writing. If I've used lobbed, I want the lob. Now you, in your own writing, and we're pretending this is our own writing. If you're coming across this and you're like, wow, you're right. Inflected, lobbed, and things like that are all pretty weird words. Do I want to be using this? You could totally ask yourself that. But I want to remember, our job is not necessarily, you know, we're in two minds. You're feeling embarrassed. Don't feel embarrassed. Um, we're of two minds on this because it's someone else's piece. But if I were editing someone else's piece, I would never note those three things. In my own piece, I would say, hmm, do I want to do this? Does that make sense? Um, these are word choice sorts of things. We're looking to make this more, more specific, though. So I'm glad you brought that up. But I do want to warn the editors, if you're editing somebody, be very careful about when you try to change their diction and things like this. Look for words when they, you think they've used the wrong word and they were shooting for the right word and they just didn't know what it was. Or if you're like, this is a better word here um, that you were shooting for. Okay, someone who hasn't raised their hand or haven't called them before, go for it. Um, the the <laughs> yes, um, I would say that this is definitely, unless this is omniscient and I haven't noticed it, um, this is technically a viewpoint error. Now, this could be a stylistic choice, but it is something to be aware of. That's a viewpoint. Why is this a viewpoint error? She can't notice, him not, she can't notice, him not, she can't notice herself not noticing him until he touches her, right? Um, there are styles of writing where people just do this consistently, and as long as you're consistent. But be aware, that's a viewpoint error. Okay, what else do we got? <coughs> In the back. Yes, yes. Okay, lactinian inflection. You're right. It is. It is inflection. That is just a typo. T I O N. <laughs> oh, I got the wrong one. It's the problem going from the screen. Inflection. Okay. So one thing I noticed up here is um, that I, I really like the whole palms thing, but I don't get a visual at all on this guy. Right now, we don't want to break action too much. But there's a guy that that's here, and we've got a whole thing on his um, his his tone and everything that she's reading into it without ever telling us what he looks like. Um, and so maybe this is a world where tone 
is way more important than the way someone looks. But as a reader, I'm like, big burly guy, little skinny guy. Um, you know, is he 90? Is he handsome and 22? Those are very different guys to sneak up on me. Um, <laughs> right? Um, <coughs> so who is this guy? And that's not to say that I want four or five paragraphs of description here or even one. But as a writer, when I run across this, I'm like, ah, eh, I probably want a line of description about this guy other than his palms, which are, is really good. Well, even just describing the hands a little bit would help if they're all. Oh, that's right. There you go. Yeah. Hand. Yeah. Yeah, right here. Mm -hmm. Are the fingernails well trimmed? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes, in the back. Yes, you. There are two hands in the row, so that's why I did the back. She's closer, so you're you're in the back. Yeah, um, I think your, your instinct there could be right in this sort of thing. The thing is you need the seam to to avoid viewpoint errors if you describe it this way. But what is a general error of amusement look like? Can we come up with how a general error of amusement is? And sometimes you just want to say he has a general error of amusement. But if you didn't, what can we do? What's a way to show that someone is bemused? Uh-huh. Right. If he's saying, whoa, whoa, take it easy, and smiling, um, Riley, that's different from, whoa, whoa, take it easy. He stepped back and glared at me, right? Um, th those are things they're doing, yeah. Or like a twinkle in his eye. Yeah, twinkle in his eye. Twinkles are so hard to judge what a twinkle even means, but yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right, let's clap. Good job, yay! Thank you for putting up with us, yeah, carving apart your writing. All right, let's go to Rick. Rick, where are you? Rick, yay, Rick! All right. Um, all right, let's read this whole thing that's on the screen right here, and I'm going to add tabs because it didn't get across for you. Yes. Ten minutes, great. Okay, so um, what I liked about this piece is, again, we've got some nice character stuff going on in this piece. We get, by the end of this, we know this character in just four paragraphs. We already got a sense for who she is, right? This is really solid characterization um, for her. And even him, with a few words here and there, we know kind of you know, what we've got going on here, um, the character dynamic between them. Um, so... What can we do? Let's, let's look at, this, at the top here. What things stand out to you if you are, again, we are not trying to change their piece. We are trying to make it more active and concrete and more readable. That might just be because I chopped off the paragraphs before this. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. This did, but this didn't start a scene just like this. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. What, is it, what does he smell like? He's really close to her. And anytime you're writing a, a story where there are two people of opposite genders, that one is obviously flirting with the other, there's going to be some sort of attraction stuff going on, even if it's subtle, like scent and, oh, wow, he's really close to me, and things like this. Um, with this, I'm like, is there no, like, no attraction at all? Um, maybe there's not. Maybe this character, this, these two characters, but this seems to imply flirtation um, for me, to me. So I'm like, why is there no, no, no sensory detail on him and whether or not he's handsome and whether or not these arms are strong or whatnot? Yeah. You possibly could. That's a stylistic choice, but it is the style I prefer. And I do think you could go like this. Um, um, and this is a really hard one. Oh, let's not put that over there because then we can't read it. This is a really hard one because this stuff is awesome. Like this is hilarious. But this whole jumble of thoughts is also distracting us from the fact that there's a guy there with his hand over her mouth. Um, it's like, can you get all these thoughts in those few moments? So the jumble is really helping to say, you're going to get a jumble of thoughts right here. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, like a, it's like a topic sentence for this jumble. So it's really a hard one to decide if I would cut or not. Um, um, yeah, and I might just look at this and say, can I trim these things down a little bit and make it shorter? I'm not sure. Um, this is all really fun stuff. Um, but I might, for instance, this one, will all of our conversation involve him ambushing me somehow? I would probably move that one down. Because you can end with the, um, the hey, you cut his short, hair short. That's kind of, that, I don't know, you know that you've got this whole attractive thing. This is a fun line on its own. It doesn't need to go in the jumble. And so simply moving it down to somewhere else can give you Sometimes in these big scenes where we're like, you know, wondering about character um, thoughts as we're losing them through dialogue, you've got that nice little line you can move in there. So that's probably what I would do. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, wow. Hey. No, that's a real legit thing that I've never mentioned. When I took this class from Dave, he said, you have to watch out for the phrase is like, he flew across the room. Um, because in a fantasy novel, he flew across the room. Could mean two different things, <laughs> right? He they, crossed the room in a hurry, or he flew into the air across the room. And so lines like that, you have to be a little extra careful about. Uh, nice. Yes. Uh-huh. It could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just got want to decide for yourself. Like when I picked this one, the reason I picked it is I thought this paragraph probably could set the scene for the rest of this a little bit better um, with a little bit more sensory detail. Um, but I wanted to bring it up as a, as a conversation point. I don't know that I would change um, very much of this at all because it reads and flows really well. Um, and I, I might just like even cut this one um, and try to trim it down even more. I kind of like this one, um, but I kind of don't. Um, because the more you can trim through a sequence like this, you don't want to leave it completely stark. But and letting the two characters play off each other, the stronger the scene is generally going to be. So, so yeah. Right. Yes, it's it actually slows the pace down. Um, interjections slow the pace. Um, so this is actually all of it up front, and then a bunch of stuff like this is actually going to be paced faster a lot of times than taking one sentence and putting it in between each sense of dialogue. It's going to read really choppily 
in that case. But you do need some um, little things, like her grin and reply. One of the things about the, the, this working in here is everything that's in this section with the dialogue is related directly to the dialogue rather than distracting us from it. It's enhancing the dialogue. Um, even despite what people say about no adverbs, I, I like using them um, more often. I mean, I think this calmly means something to us um, uh, because if you went and did a large show, which you could do that he's calm in here, it would take our, uh, our sense away from the conversation. Now, some people would say, always get rid of that and put in the show that he's calm. That can be your own stylistic choice. I would leave the calmly because it's serving a purpose, and it's letting you, in this dialogue, not have a big, long, descriptive sentence to show how calm he is. Instead, it's letting us focus on the interaction between them. We're out of time. Um, so. Thank you, guys. I'm gone for three weeks. Uh, be nice to your substitutes. When I get back, we'll talk about the business, OK? Bring up your little dealies, and uh, have a good day. Oh, and we'll clap. Thank you.